All right, welcome everyone to this video here. Uh, I just wanted to take and kind of recap the series, revive the series a little bit, and uh, show you just sort of a start to finish buffer overflow with a pivot and a little bit of shellcode, custom shellcode. So let's start, just jump right in here. We've got a basic buffer overflow, and this varies if you watch the videos that were previously in the series. Uh, I used a, you know, a simple stack-based buffer, which we're using here and also um, arguments from the command line. And that can get a little tricky with Windows, especially if you're trying to use command.exe. It can mangle some of the input and not like uh, non-printable characters or bytes. And so this just modifies slightly and uses a file. So we'll get a file pointer here to a file payload.bin and read first, determine the size of the file. So here's our file size, and then it uses that file size to read all of the content into the buffer. And this is, of course, where the overflow occurs, because if our buffer is of a fixed size, 512 in this case, then reading beyond that and allowing the size of the file to determine how much to read is the problem. A bit contrived, yes, but not completely unrealistic. Um, there are some other things that I'm going to do here just to help facilitate this example, because again, this is primarily for learning, and that I have this little pivot function and I'm defining this jump ESP to be the opcode or the bytes FFE4. And FFE4 will be emitted here. That is a jump ESP instruction. So that ensures that that instruction is available in, bi in this binary, in memory, consistently when we run the program. Now, this is also a bit contri contrived because normally this pivot and finding these addresses with different instructions or gadgets that you need uh, can be a bit challenging. It's part of what makes uh, ASLR, address space layout randomization, effective, and um, it's just part of the, you know, the challenges of exploitation. So those are some little caveats there with this binary. Uh, of course, if we're looking at exploiting a program, we may or may not have the source code, but we do have the source code in this case. You'll see it's a 512 byte buffer. Now, in terms of compiling this program, covered this earlier in the series. Um, I guess first things first, I'm using this command right here in order to disable uh, DEP, data execution prevention. So this just shuts it off in the VM. And then as far as compiling the program, a couple of things here that are helpful. GS dash will disable the stack cookie. So that is a modern day compiler added uh, mitigation. I've got videos on that if you want to dig a little bit deeper there. And then dynamic base, that just tells the binary and the operating through the, the tells the operating system through the binary not to use ASLR. Um, and that helps because now we have the same default image base 400,000 hex whenever we run this program. So there's our target binary. Now, when it comes to crafting the overflow, what we're going to do is we're actually going to use a little bit of Python here, and we'll go through this in a few different pieces. We have our shell code. We'll come back to that. So I'm going to leave that condensed, and there's a couple options here for how we paste that or, or capture our shell code. We have step one, though, which is the offset. And so if you think about the buffer, the buffer is going to be of a fixed size, and we have to explore the program in order to understand that. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is to send enough data to overwrite the entire buffer and then anything else that's on the stack, perhaps local variables, until we get to the return address. And so we have to be able to figure out what this number is in order to, to take our overwrite right to the point where we then can overwrite the return address with something very particular, which is what I'm calling buff adder. And so what this script is going to do is it's basically going to build this payload, write it as a file, so that then the program can pick it up and we can exploit that. In order to calculate the size, we'll go into IDA. So we've got this program open in IDA, and we know if we look at fread, if we look at the, the function calls here, it's this fread that is of interest, right? And if we had not looked at this program at all, this could be then a way of, of, of analyzing different APIs to see where is input being fed into the program that is, and how is it being validated, verified, controlled. And so here with, F read. Here's the prototype. You can see the first argument is the pointer to the buffer. Ida labels that buffer. So we can double click on this. And um, looks like I already did this. Let's see if I can undo. Yeah, there we go. So uh, this looks a little bit more like a default state. If we double click on the buffer, you'll see that the beginning of the buffer is referenced. And then we can right click and convert that to an array. And in this case, Ida does a great job of saying this is a 512 byte. Uh, array, byte-sized elements. 
then we have a couple of additional local variables here. We have this element count, at least that's what Ida calls it, and our file pointer. So we know that this is not actually element count, this is the size of the file that's being read, and then this is the pointer. So these are the, the stack that's being used for local variables. Now we have internal stack. We have the save registers. This is the old value of EPP before we finally hit that return address. And so what we can do in order to calculate this distance, okay, we know we're going to start writing at this buffer, and we have to write all the way until we get to this point, the save registers, the old EBP, and then we want to place a precise four byte value here in the return address. So um, this begins offset zero, 208. We need to be inclusive of this size. So if we just add four more bytes to 208, then we'll have the total distance in bytes to overwrite EBP. So 208, we'll just open up a calculator and I'll try to be consistent here between base 10 and uh, hexadecimal. So let's use, uh, you already saw in the, in the Python script that I was in base 10. So if we go to hex and we do two, what did I say, 208 plus four, so that would be 20C. In decimal, that's 524. So we go back here, you can see, all right, there's 524. And this is just a comment. I'll post this somewhere and add the link in the description here. Uh, but this just tells you the breakdown that we just talked about. So 528 bytes total to overwrite the return address. So 524 bytes, we're just sending data. And as you can see down here, what is that data? Well, uh, we're just taking the ASCII character, the uppercase A, which is a hex 41, and we're multiplying that times the offset. So 524, so that's overwriting everything. Then we have this buff adder. And you'll see here, we're just gonna leave this as a placeholder to make sure that we can control this crash. That's dead beef. This struct.pack will ensure, based off of the Indianness, um, that it'll write that multi-byte value into our, our payload with the appropriate Indianness. So that gets added then at the location beginning where the return address is overwritten. Then the rest of the payload adds some null bytes for a NOP sled. NOP sleds can be uh, very helpful when you don't have uh, a precise control of the pivot. I guess the notes do a pretty good job of saying that. And then we'll add our shell code in. So we'll, we'll get to this in just a moment. Let's make sure that this actually works. So now what we can do is we'll go into a debugger and I'm gonna use the, ex the advanced so that we can choose the path to our executable as you can see right here. And then I wanna define the start directory. And I just noticed a couple of issues with picking up the file if I didn't do this. So now what will happen is we can start to debug the program we can go back to a terminal here and we can run our Python script so that we can get the payload, payload.bin, written to the file system. I can just take a quick, a quick peek at that, payload.bin, and open that with a hex editor. And you'll see the contents of our payload. There's all our hex 41s. Here's our address, dead beef for right now. Then that transitions to the NOPs and then eventually the shell code. Okay, so we can see that clearly the structure as intended based off of the Python, that Python script. So um, now we go back to, well, before we go back to the debugger, I say we go to Ida and where this should take effect, right? Fread buffer, we're going to overwrite the buffer there. It's when this function returns. So let's set a breakpoint at this address. Sorry, I don't know where that where that just went. We'll set a breakpoint at that address. So BP and that address. And now we can resume because when we started this debug session, it loaded the executable in any of the imports, but it didn't begin execution. So now we run it, we're at the ret. So there we are in our disassembly view. And I'll just use the DDESP to look at the top of the stack. And what we're hoping to see is that on the top of the stack is the overwrite of the return address, which is this case is dead beef. And there's the rest of the null bytes and then our shell code. So if we step and we return to that address, what we should see is that EIP, yes, it went to the address dead beef. There's nothing there to execute. And it's probably not even a valid address in memory. So the program is now crashed. Okay, so let's restart. This takes us to the point where we want to perform the pivot. That is, we need to tell EIP 
to execute code, not execute code in the text section where it's at right now, pivot to the stack, executing code on the stack. Now, this is where had the stack guard, the stack canaries been enabled, they would have prevented the overflow, would have detect, detected the overflow quite likely. Um, and on top of that, we have depth, data execution prevention. So as we would pivot and EIP would try to execute a byte on the stack, it would also cause termination, access violation, termination of the program, right? So we've got those disabled. Now the program's ready to go. And in order to perform the pivot, what we need to do is we want to update this address, right? We want it to, we want to return to a location that tells EIP to start executing code on the stack. So one straightforward way to do this, maybe not the most effective, is just to search. Okay, so I'm gonna search in the binary itself. Here's the start and end range. And what we can do is S, we can define where we wanna start searching. So that's a four and five zeros, and then the length. So we know that this, the length of this image is, is um, for, you know, it's the end address, 418000 minus the start address, uh, which for us fortunately, or for me anyway, is easy math. It's just 18000. Um, and then the bytes, FFE4, right? We might have to look at different modules. And if you know, you go back to more like the earlier days of exploitation, this is where you'd see exploits saying, hey, there's a module that's loaded in this process and it doesn't use ASLR. So it's a good one to use because it's the, you know, the instructions, the gadgets, the things are always gonna be at a fixed address. So you can see now where this becomes a lot more relevant. You know, ASLR, for example, if our image itself was using ASLR, then these addresses would always be a little bit different based off of how ASLR is changing those, those base address. Okay, but as we talked about, we fixed it. I added a little bit of a, of a helper here by inserting these bytes to make sure that they'd be available so that um, you know, we could successfully go through this binary as an example. So there's the address, 40100C, and go back to Python script, we see there is the address, 40100C. So we save that generate our new payload, go back to our debugger. I'm gonna set a breakpoint on the return. And now we'll, we will step to the return, make sure that on top of the stack is our address, which there it is. And now we can step so that you can see we're returning to that address, 401.00c, and most importantly, the instruction that is there, jump ESP. So now we will follow that jump, and now we are on the stack. We're executing code on the stack, and we've hit this knob sled. So will this be, in this case, this binary, exactly in the state it's in, will always pivot to this point on the stack. So the knob sled's not really necessary here, but the idea behind them is that oftentimes when you have these buffer overflows, you, you, know, you go back and look at the original code here, um, likely if you're able to overwrite a buffer, it's because you had something that was writing to that buffer and that overwrite then corrupts the stack and it happens recently. It happens relatively recently to where the overflow likely occurred. So likely when something crashes, there is a register or something pointing to that buffer, but it may not always be consistent. And so sometimes, you know, a big part of this is if we didn't have all of this information in this sort of canned environment, you know, we would try to get a program to crash and then we would start inspecting what's happened. What are the state of the registers at the time of the crash? And can we utilize that in order to maybe perform this pivot? So um, in this case, we don't necessarily need the NOP sled, but now the NOP sled allows for a lack of precision so that you can say, okay, and when it crashes, um, you know, this register or this register points to the stack, but it's not always at the same offset or the same location. So the NOP sled allows you to kind of catch that. Uh, you'll see though, if we, we could set a breakpoint here now. Had DEP been enabled, we would not be executing code. This first NOP, let's just step one time. Um, this would have caused an access violation, but because DEP is disabled, uh, now we can go all the way down and our shell code can begin to execute. Um, this is custom shell code. I'll have pl plenty of videos on the channel if you want to learn how to write this yourself. And in particular, some of the techniques that I use in the shell code, but uh, it is the traditional pop calc. So you'll see it uses winexec and the string calc to pop calc and then exits the process. Okay, so the last thing then I'll just point out here is the shell code itself. So we go back to the payload.py. 
Um, okay, so we have the shell code. And as you can see here, I mean, there's a couple different ways in which we can get the shell code in here, depending on where you get it and, uh, and, and how, you know, how, how maintainable you want it to be. I actually used uh, an LLM to uh, generate these opcode bytes and it did it in a very nice way in that it's it's well documented. We have all the instructions here. It wasn't 100% accurate though. It introduced some bugs. So you do need to be careful. A few of the bytes were off. And so I had to fix that. But I like this way of representing the shell code because then you can see all of the instructions. So it makes it a little bit easier for, for maintenance and whatnot. Um, at the end of the day though, this is really all you need. You can see up above, uh, let me turn on word wrap. You just need an array of byte values. And uh, this would suffice. This would be no different than the one below, just a lot less human readable, right? We look at this and um, we, you, know, you, you don't really know what it's doing just at the surface level. At least uh, I think most for most people, it'd be hard just to look at this sequence of bytes and say, oh, this is gonna pop calc. Um, how do we get it into this state? So here we have some assembly. And again, I've got videos on the channel here if you're interested in learning more about these techniques and in particular, exactly how this shell code works. So I'll add that video if I don't shortly. Um, but we have assembly to begin with our shell code. And all we need to do is, uh, you know, once the shell code works, now that can be a, a big challenge if you're writing custom. Uh, I like to use NASM and we can use NASM to assemble the shell code. This will produce a file called payload. We can take a look at that here. Payload. There it is. There is. Uh, this is just the assembled machine code now of our from our shell code, right there. And I think maybe in this case, CyberChef is probably the easiest way. So I just added the file, opened the file in CyberChef, used the two hex recipe, gave the backslash x delimiter, and there you go copy and pasta into payload.py, just like you see here. So if we were to uncomment this, this would be valid and that would then allow the program, in this case, to append the show code to our payload file, which would then get picked up by the vulnerable program. Okay, so that's all I wanted to share here. Hope you enjoyed the video. What's next? Well, um, you can explore things like how do you bypass stack cookies? I guess that's quite hard. Um, how do you get past DEP? And that's probably the more the more enticing route if you're interested. That will take you down the path of ROP or return oriented program programming. Think about that. Uh, the, I guess the high level with ROP is that let's say that your your shell code, your the, the thing that you're exploiting is on the stack. And how do we get around then the fact that the stack is not executable? Well, you never execute something on the stack, right? This works because we're pivoting the instruction pointer to execute code on the stack. But if on the stack is nothing but return addresses and those return addresses then return the little chunks of code and it's those locations and that code already in an executable place in memory then you piece together the capability that you want let's say that you use that in order to make the stack executable or you allocate a new region of memory copy some shell code there and then jump to that region to do something more advanced and so you have your payload then being a series of addresses that are just returning. You're just jumping to a little snippet of memory, a little location in memory, like that jump ESP, but they all end in a return so that it goes back to the stack. You get the next address, you go someplace, execute those instructions or two or three or four, return back to the stack, get the next instruction. Sounds really complicated. It kind of is, but it's also fun. So ROP is the next thing. Maybe I'll do a video. I'm not sure, but if that's something that you're interested in, I would I recommend that as the kind of the next step in the evolution here. So anyways, hope you enjoyed the video. Talk to you all soon.